approach to the infertile female uh, by dr professor n sanjeev reddy now i call upon dr sanjeev reddy to deliver the lecture sir thank you sir at the outset i would like to thank the president dr k subramaniam uh, secretary dr bhupati jain and other office bearers of ima bodambaku branch for in and particularly dr venkat sai for inviting me here and share some of my thoughts with you all today's my topic is approach to infertile couple infertile female as all of you know infertility is the failure to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse this condition affects approximately 10 to 15% of reproductive age couples there are two types primary infertility and secondary infertility primary infertility means couples who have not become pregnant after at least one year of having sex without using birth control methods in secondary infertility couple might have conceived once after that she is not conceived then we will call it as secondary infertility if the cumulative pregnancy rate is important this is the chance of that particular couple conceiving that particular month if you take at the end of one month almost 40% of patients will become pregnant at the end of 3 months around 70% of patients will become pregnant at the end of 6 months 80% at the end of 12 months 90% of patients will become pregnant the chance of cost by this one year why we will start investigate after one year if you see this table at the end of one year almost 84% of patients they will become conceive on their own at the end of two years it will be around 92% at the end of three years only 93% that means even the after one year if the time exceeds the chance of their becoming pregnancy is very less that's why it is advisable to start investigating a patient after one year if she they are not conceiving then most of the time our mother in laws will be blaming the daughter in laws they are responsible for infertility if you see this table all both are important male female and combined and in 10 to 15% of patient we don't know the all the investigations whatever is done will be normal we will call that patient as unexplained cause if you take the each cause wise male factor will be responsible up to 30% ovulatory factor around 25% tubal factor around 20% others will be uh, 13% and combined will be this will be varying from one one where we have done the studies it will be 40% and un unexplained also 15 to 30% will be varying in different places next is the prevalence of infertility if you say the age is important we take less than 35 years the incidence is only around 10% if the beyond 35% it rises to 25% and the patient reaches around 40% 40 years the incidence will be around 30% that's why any patient comes we should not after one year of marriage we should not uh, delay investigation and giving treatment then diagnostic evaluation in what infertile couples will you wait for every patient until one year no if the patient age is less than 35 years you can wait one year if the patient is above 35 years and less than 40 years in 6 months itself we start investigating if the patient is more than 40 years then even immediately after the marriage you have to start investigating what are the diagnostic evaluation sometimes we have to do earlier also we won't wait for one year six months like that whenever the patient is having irregular periods like oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea that itself shows that patient is anovulatory we have to start investigating immediately known or suspected uterine tubal peritoneal disease or stage 3 or 4 endometriosis then also we have to investigate known or suspected male infertility like oligospermia there is they are having sexual dysfunction then you have to start in for um investigate earlier then history taking is important in infertility we will see female infertility we have to check what is the duration of infertility is importance as the duration increases 3 to 5 years beyond that one 
even if you go for the ivf the chance of them becoming pregnancy will be less than previous evaluation and treatment many investigation no need for us to repeat again and again we'll get some information menstrual history pregnancy history here whether she had any pregnancy what happened like that one whether they went to any mtps or ended up in miscarriage that will give us because secondary infertility for them the chance of becoming pregnancy more than the primary infertility next previous contraceptive history suppose they might have used uh, any intrauterine contraceptive device so that can produce tubal block chiatal history one is whether they are practicing vaginal chiatus or not whether they are using any lubricants then whether they are having that sufficient like they may say like the first two or three days or last at the end of the month if they are meeting that frequency of chiatus is important usually from day 10 to day 15 to 16 that period is the important because that is the ovulatory period there only patient will conceive fast surgery suppose particularly in female if there is any surgery abdominal surgery they can develop peritubular additions can lead to blockage tubes and also thyroid problem galactory if there is any secretion from the breast and the histism that is excess androgens also will interfere with ovulation current medication and allergies that can interfere with the ovulatory population family history of reproductive early menopause birth defects we have to elicit in detail occupational and exposure to known environmental or environmental hazards also important use of tobacco alcohol and recreational drugs it is very less in our country but picking up then op- detailed history we have to go for the thorough physical examination like weight and height bmi to calculate the bmi if you see this table whenever the bmi is very high the chance of her becoming pregnancy is very less next thyroid enlargement breast examination for the lumps and secretions signs of androgen excess and then we have to go for the other bimanual examination speculum examination vaginal cervical abnormalities or any discharge is there next is abdominal pelvic tenderness or mass also you have to make out bimanual examination you have to make out the uterine size shape and mobility whether there is any adnexal tenderness or masses cul de sac masses nodularity and tenderness only two condition you will get one is pid another one is uh, endometriosis it is easy for us yeah. after taking history and thorough examination how to evaluate i am going to give you algorithmic approach what are the problem what investigation to do how to come to your diagnosis see always history physical examination is important then there should be if you want to start a treatment for any infertility patient there are three investigations important one is semen analysis you have to know that itself will give for the male whether is normal or there is an abnormality next is always always we have to exclude the tubal factor in a female that is hsg we can do then we want to know whether the patient is ovulating or not if suppose this three are normal then we will call this patient as unexplained infertility so suppose if anything is normal there are various ways male may be the seminal also may be abnormal next is tubal factor or the peritoneal factor uterine factor ovulatory dysfunction reduced ovarian reserve these are the problems you can face in the thing so we will examine each one we will go to the unexplained infertility so here a patient who is having semen analysis is normal tubal factor is normal patient is regularly menstruating if patient is not conceived in spite of one year then we will call it as unexplained here suppose if she had uh, previously hsg then we have to advise hysteroscopy this is that first investigation she requires depending upon this suppose if it is normal then see the age whether she is less than 35 35 to 40 or above 40 if she is less than 45 there is no other problems young age around 20 25 like that you sometimes you can wait one another 6 months also there is a chance is there she can become pregnant suppose she is not become pregnant suppose the patient is slightly older then you do the iua advise iua here you can go for the oral ovulogens like clomiphenicetate and with uh, do three iuas if she is not conceiving then you go to the gonadotropin plus iua for three more cycles still if she is not conceiving then we have to go for only ivf 
Suppose the patient is above 35 years. Here, if other factors are normal, then you can use the FS uh, gonadotropin induced IUI. If she is not conserving for three cycles, then you can go for the IVF. If the patient is above 40, directly go to the IVF. Suppose the histolaparoscopy is abnormal. You have to see which are the problems like tubular or peritoneal factor is there, correctable. You can correct and go for the gonadotropin induced IUI. Then if she is not conceiving, then you can go for the IVF. Suppose if it is not uncorrectable, directly go for the IVF. So unexplained, it is easy for us. Just subject the patient for histolaparoscopy. laparoscopy. Then depending upon that one, you can take decision what you can do. Next is we'll uh, discuss about the reduced ovarian reserve. So there are so many ovarian reserve tests. Uh, they're like biological. Age is the best thing biochemical, biophysical, history, don't get confused. Only three are important apart from age. You know, biochemical investigation is the AMH and biophysical investigation, the antral follicle count by transvaginal scan. These three will give us maximum information. Here, how to diagnose a reduced ovarian reserve? If you do the day three FSH and E2, if the FSH level is more than 10 million international units per ml, or E2 is above 70 micrograms per ml that shows the patient is having decrease of ovarian reserve. Next is abnormal clone pin challenges. CGD, this is not uh, useful. We are not nowadays doing. Next is subject this patient for transvaginal scan. Here we can make out the antral follicle counts. This will be the size of the follicle is two to nine millimeters. You just count both ovaries. If it is less than seven, then we'll call it as decrease. Suppose if you are sending for biochemical investigation like serum anti mullerian hormone, if it is less than one nanogram per ml, this is also shows that is decrease. All patient comes to you with previous ovulation reduction with some other doctor that itself will tell us it is documented poor ovarian reserve. So how to go about this patient? What are the treatment or options available? That depends upon mainly age. Suppose she is less than 35 years, so go for the gonadotropin uh, induced ovulation with IA one cycle and see the number of follicles. If there is more than three mature follicles she develops. So here you can go for three cycles of IUA. If she is not conceiving, then go for the IVF. Suppose the number of follicles developed with the gonadotropin IUA is less than three mature follicles, then she is not good. We cannot go for IUF also. You advise them other things like either they can go for the mature follicles, then better for them. This patient is not fit for IVF also. Better to go for the egg donation, IVF or adoption. If the, there is more than four mature follicles are there, you can advise them IVF. If the patient age is above 40 years, better ask them because already reduced uh, uh, reserve here, better for them to go for the adoption or do, if they are very particular, we can go advise them donor oocyte IVF. Then we'll see the ovulated dysfunction. This is the commonest cause for infertility. Here, how to go about? Simple way. Just see whether the patient is, whether there is any signs of symptoms of hyperandrogenism or there is no symptoms of hyperandrogenism. So these are, suppose if there is signs of hyperandrogenism is there, these are the three investigations we are needed. Testosterone first we'll do. If it is elevated, then you have to go for the DHEAS. Then if there is a DHEA is elevated, we want to differentiate whether it is of adrenal origin or ovarian origin. If the DHEA is elevated, that shows it is of adrenal origin. If it is only um, DHEA is normal, that is of ovarian origin, particularly PCOS patient. Next is 17 OHP. If you are suspecting con congenital adrenal hyperplasia, if the level of 17 OHP is more than two nanograms per ml, then she needs extra test. If you are able to, you can manage. Otherwise, you can refer this patient to the higher center or endocrinologist. Suppose there is no signs of hyperandrogenum, but still patient is anovulatory. These are the three investigations we have to do. TSH, 
prolactin and FSH. Suppose TSH is raised, it's a simple treating this patient, you can go give the thyroxin for these patients. If the prolactin is elevated, we have to find out what is the reason for the elevation. Some, then we have to elicit detail whether she is on any medication. Suppose the antipsychotic drugs itself will increase the prolactin levels. Just simple breast stimulation itself will increase. That's why if you want to advise prolactin estimation, they should go in the morning and do like that without doing any other work. That time, the stimulation won't be there. Next is the high, if it is more than 50 nanograms or 100 nanograms, you have to suspect uh, pituitary adenomar also. Always, we all raised prolactin, hyperprolactin is there. Always, we have to exclude hypothyroidism because that raising factor is common for both the things. That's why it can increase the prolactin also. So we have to always exclude the hypothyroidism. Next is estimation of the FSH we have to do. It may be normal, it may be low, and FSH. We'll see that one later, what is it is importance. Here, so direct, uh, how to diagnose of ovulated disorder to come directly. History and physical examination, I told you like that. FSH and prolactin, these two hormones are important. So I told you the FSH may be low, normal, or increase. So if FSH is low, then we have to see body weight and pituitary imaging to exclude any pituitary problems or whether there is any anorexia nervosa is there, this type of things. If everything is normal, then the diagnosis is simple. It is called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. It comes under WHO group one. The management is simple. Either you can go for the GNRH analogs, pulse type GNRH, that is pump is not available. So the simple way is gonotropin, that is HMG, we can give for this patient. If not, if FSH level is normal, then you have to check the body weight and pelvic scan to exclude PCOS. This is the commonest PCOS is the, here normal FSH will be there. So not, so this one we'll call it as normogonotropic and ovulation, it will come under group two, WHO group two. The simple treatment here is lifestyle modification, weight reduction. So then we have to go, suppose patient is not, with that itself patient can conceive, if she is not conceiving, then we can try the oral ovulogens like clomiphene citrus, letrozole, sometimes we can add metformin also. Suppose she is not responding to these clomiphene citrate field, then we can go for the gonotropins. And there is surgical method also available, that is laparoscopic ovarian dilling. My request is just like that, don't go and do like that. We only select two cases we can do. Otherwise, it can produce a lot of problem like that. Patient can go for premature ovarian failure also with laparoscopic ovarian dilling. Even if you go for the IVF also, that patient won't respond. The pregnancy rate will be very less. So the FSS level is very high. So we have to do the karyotyping to exclude the genetic cause and also anti uh, auto antibodies to exclude immunological causes. So this is the called hypergonotropic hypogonadism. It comes under group three WHO grouping. Here the treatment is only donor X is available. So if the FSH is raised, they, we cannot manage in the simple clinic. Though these patients only available is donor IVF or they have to go for the adoption. If the prolactin is increased. I told you like that we have to exclude the hypothyroidism and also pituitary tumors, microadenomas we have to exclude. This biomedical subject for CT thing. If these two are normal, then we'll brand this one as hyperprolactemia. It will come and some people, they will say it is group under group four of WHO. This treatment is simple. You can give the dopamine agonists like bromocryptin or cabergolin. If the macrodynamo is there, it is putting some problems. In spite of this drug, patient is not responding. Then only we'll go for the surgery. Next, we'll discuss about the uterine factors. So here, the uterine factor, there are two, uh, this can be diagnosed by just HSG or ultrasound. So HSG, we'll see what are things. There may be congenital problems or acquired problems. In congenital Acquired problems like intracavity marks like fibroid polyp. This can be confirmed by sonosalp histography. Just inject little saline into the cavity. Then again, you do the 
transvaginal scan you can make out clearly suppose if it is there then you can go for the hysteroscopic resection of the polyp so if you do this one the patient will conceive on her own suppose after doing just if the patient is young seminal is normal just you can wait for some time six months like that there is a chance that 50 percent chance the patient can conceive on her own suppose if she is not conceiving then we have to go for the other treatments like what we have given no, previously like iui for three cycles to clomiphene chondrotropins then if she is not responding then you can go for the um, ivf next is the common next problem is the acid man syndrome this is intrauterine additions so you have to go for the hysteroscopic resection of the traditions if it is correctable correct this one then just if your patient is young everything is normal you can wait for some time otherwise you have to go for the uh, iua if she fails then you have to go for the ivf sometimes if suppose hysteroscopy we are not able to uh, resect the additions completely you can try repeat surgery that is also correctable what we told you like that you can go for the iui then ivf suppose if it is not correctable with that also then it is failed to correction then this patient is not fit for ivf you have to go for only gestational here only we have to go for the surrogacy you can take the oocytes from the patient then we have to use the other person's uterus or if they are not willing for that one then they have to go for the adoption next is mullier anomalies so this is uterine septum is the commonest uterine anomaly that is the commonest for producing miscarriages so here if she comes with uh, history of previous miscarriages other things so simple surgery is hysteroscopic resection of the septum that's the medical capacity so after uh, resection just most of the time patient can conceive otherwise same way like uh, like you can go for the iea three cycles if she is not conceiving then you can go for the ivf bicarbonate and unicarbonate uterus also you can make out these things they doesn't need any operation just observation only thing we have to take care is if you are inducing ovulation or i doing iea you should take there should not be multiple pregnancy always try to be, uh, plan for only single follicle so that sh there will be single baby because there is more chance for this patient delivering prematurely so that create a lot of problems that's why as much as possible and the way the patient conceives also more chance for this patient developing cervical incompetence so these patients only will be requiring the circlage next we'll go to the tubal and peritoneal factor here so hs itself will give us a tubal factor also it will tell us so the one commonest problem what you can make out by hs is there may be blocks or maybe normal so we have to see whether it is bilateral or unilateral block and also if there is a block is there then we have to see whether it is distal block or proximal block if there is a distal block is there minimal things we can correct with the hist uh, laparoscopy otherwise most of the time when the pimbre is damaged whatever treatment is there the patient won't become pregnant better to go for the ivf next is some if it is small and if it is going to be associated with hydrosalpings even if you go for the ivf then the pregnancy rate will be very less there only will go for the salpingectomy otherwise not necessary if there is no hydrosalping no need for us to remove the tube suppose there is a block is there proximal thing proximal tubal block so then what we can do is we can hysteroscopic proximal tubal cannulation we can try if it is successful then you can allow the patient to conceive on their own or you can do the ovulation induction plus iua there is a chance that she can become pregnant if she is not become pregnant in spite of iua then we have to go for the ivf suppose if it is not successful then directly go for the ivf if suppose if it is unilateral block don't bother about the block you can treat this patient as normal so you can go for the ovulation induction plus ia three cycles if she is not conceiving then you can go for the ivf suppose some patients are young you want to give them try then you can do the in spite of the three cycles of ia patient is not conceiving 
then you can subject this patient for hysterolaparoscopy. So here, so if you're able to correct, you can allow them for uh, intrauterine insemination, patient is become pregnant. Suppose if it is not there, then you have to go for the IVF. Suppose if the distal block is there and associated with hydrosalpings one side, then you remove the tube. Always try to check the tube of the other tube, whether it is normal or not. Always you have to take the consent before removing the tube. If the contralateral tube is normal, you can try IVI. Uh, if you're able to correct by laparoscopy, if it is not conceiving with that, then you can go for the IVF if it is not conceiving. The contralateral tube also is abnormal, then only chance is IVF is available. So then when you do the laparoscopy, so these are the findings you can get, whether we will be able to correct or not correctable. If the patient, it is the problem is correctable, proceed with treatment, then if that is like peritubal addition, small uh, things, pimbial occlusion is there that if you are released or mild endometriosis is there that you can't rise, then you can go for the IUI. And suppose if the IUI, it's in spite of IUI, patient is not conceiving, then finally you can go for the IVF. Suppose you are not able to correct all these things, there is a bilateral tube, damaged everything, then directly go for the IVF. In conclusion, so, like uh, male evaluation is important, only simple is available, semen analysis. Without doing semen analysis, we should not do major investigations in the female and start treatment on that. If it is normal or abnormal. If it is abnormal, you have to make out, just repeat one sample itself is not enough. Always like 15 to one month gap you give, then you can go for the, again, repeat semen analysis. If it, that is also is abnormal, then only we have to investigate. Suppose if it has spermia, we won't wait for 15 days or one month. After two, three days also, you can repeat and see. Next is uh, female. We have to see whether the patient is ovulatory or not. Then there is abnormality, is there ovulatory? We have to check the tubes, whether the tubes are patent or not. Depending upon that, you can go for the ovulation induction, other things. So post tubes are normal, then induce the ovulation, go for the, with the clomiphene citrate three cycles, with the gonadotropin three cycles. If she's not conceiving, then we'll go for the IVF. Suppose if you an ovulatory, here we have to evaluate the hormones like TSH, prolactin, FXS, estradiol. These are the hormones. This all should be done. FSH, TSH and prolactin any day you can do, but FSH and estradiol day two, day three, day four is best. Next, treat underlying cause and consider ovulation induction and the same way like clomiphene citrate, gonadotropin, IUA. If it's not there, then we are going for the ERT. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Uh, we will ask Thank you, sir. Uh, the members to type in their questions or uh, ask questions. Dr. Bhupati, decide. Dr. Bhupati, you need yeah. to unmute yourself, please. Any questions from anybody? You can either raise hands or type in your message or you can come online and ask. You can unmute yourself, ask questions and then mute yourself. Are you hearing me? Hello? Yeah, hearing, sir. Yeah, you carry on, sir. I put my question in the chat box. My question is, in the doctor doctor is impotent. Ah, the one. Doing anti-sperm antibody in the ladies. What is the opinion of it? Can you clarify it? Can you be louder, sir? We can't hear you. Can you be louder? I put it in the chat box also. I put it in the chat box also. Anti-sperm antibody, sir. No, no, impotent. They're doing anti-sperm antibody in ladies. Uh, what is your opinion on it, sir? Can you direct on this? Sir, so that is uh, previously we were doing, if it is positive, we are started treating with uh, steroids. Yes. That itself will produce so much problems. Yes. Nowadays, we are not doing the, if you diagnose as anti-sperm antibodies are present, simple treatment is IUI. 
anyhow as there is not there also will be going for the iui so if you do that problem will be solved routinely not advisable to do the anti sperm antibodies per in patient thank you sir uh, and in the covid period uh, i mean all the infertile couple that is a nice news because of the because of the two months lockdown most of the infertile couple has become fertile because of the they were confined to the one room because no work at all less worries so that was the news came out sir sir what is your opinion regarding this sir uh, professor sandeep security sir they didn't follow the social distancing sir <laughs> <laughs> okay this is simple sir actually we will be so much stress that itself will affect our uh, for the ovulation and other problems like if you take it people they will be like working six days or seven days eight days from morning to evening they don't have any time to meet also that's why many times we will be telling just go for a holiday you will become pregnant so they will be tension free everything will get settled that way they have lot of time to spend together that way there is uh, more chances that they can become pregnant okay sir thank you sir so whenever you want to become a infertile become fertile we must go for lockdown sir so that is a not lockdown sir just they can go for it <laughs> like holiday holiday okay, and sir. they can stay there that, but that. they should not take the mobile phones along with them <laughs> thank you sir so nice of sir because of your uh, you have given a exhaustive list lecture and a very good information we have received sir thank you thank you uh, any other question from members Sir, I have a question, Doctor Selvam. Yes, sir. You go ahead, sir. Sir, this may not be really relevant to the topic, but uh, sir, being a very senior uh, obstetrician gynecologist, I want to play a very common question. It was put to me by one patient. Say, uh, is it advisable to ask uh, a bride and a bride, would-be bride and bridegroom to get COVID uh, tested for COVID just two days before marriage, so that they can have a hassle-free first night following the wedding? I, yes, I, that depends upon like not only for them, for everybody. Better say like uh, better to test because they are otherwise they are under tension. One party may be under tension, so they can't ask frankly directly. Because so why not advise as a doctors? We are we are if we advise people just like that follow. So did, I had a practical problem when somebody somebody was asking me this question. I said it is advisable. So I just wanted your opinion. It is advisable, so they can take if they are exposed to people. After that, also there is chance there the test is going to work for only five days. After that, they are more prone. Asymptomatic also again again how they are going to be exposed to other people that is there. But if they are going to stay in the home only, then they can yes. have like. Yes. The, the regarding the question, sir, the present guideline will be the revised guideline by the central government because in I mean you need not do COVID test for the asymptomatic patients. Suppose if it is in a containment zone, if you suspect the primary contact or secondary contact, even the asymptomatic, sir, then you can gov do that. Government uh, guidelines they will be changing according suiting for them, sir. It is not like that. Simple example I will tell you. In one place they have done for. Asymptomatic pregnant patient advanced 39 weeks, just they did. In the three patient positive, one patient is doubtful. If you do that one, what to do like that? Okay. So they will be de telling like that. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. I mean, you want to question? protect yourself and other your staff and the patient also because we don't want to transmit this one from one patient to the other patient. It is advisable. There is international government, American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Suppose in infertility, we a patient comes to us first. We have to do the.